As aspiring wildlife cinematographers, we want to do more than just point the camera and document whatever we happen to see. That's boring. My goal, and I hope you feel the same way, is to capture cinematic footage that could be used in a high-end wildlife documentary. I don't always achieve that goal, but nevertheless, that is the target that I'm aiming for every time I go out shooting. Obviously, video and still photography share many similarities, so with that in mind, I'm not going to waste a lot of time explaining basic concepts that you probably already understand. However, there are some fundamental differences between stills and video that many experienced photographers fail to appreciate when they first start shooting video. For example, consider that when a still photographer sees something interesting start to happen, he or she can quickly raise the camera up to their eye, aim it at the target, allow the camera to figure out the best exposure, let the lens focus automatically on the subject, and then they can hold down the shutter release button to fire off a burst of raw photos all within a couple of seconds or less. And if just one of those frames can be processed in Lightroom to look great, then that might be all they need to call the day a complete success. But shooting professional caliber wildlife video isn't anywhere near that simple. Now I could easily divide the differences between stills and video into two categories, creative and technical. Let's start with the creative differences first, and then we'll see how those differences will naturally dictate many technical differences when it comes to your camera settings, shooting techniques, and equipment choices. By far, the most important creative difference is how motion is captured. In still photography, we can choose to freeze it with a fast shutter speed, or we can choose to enhance it by using a slower shutter speed and purposely introducing some motion blur to an image. Both techniques are perfectly acceptable and can result in nice images. But either way, a photograph is ultimately just a single frozen moment in time. There is no actual motion captured in a photograph. But with video, the motion or action of the wildlife we're filming becomes the most important element of the shot. Without some motion in our videos, we would just have a photograph. For example, a 10 second shot of a motionless bird roosting on a branch is basically just a photograph. There are three main types of action that we can capture in our videos. First, the camera can remain stationary and all motion occurs within the frame. If the action happening within the frame is interesting enough, you might have a compelling shot but you always run the risk of having your videos look too much like a slideshow if the camera is always locked down and the animal or animals just move around within the frame. If you have too many of these static shots in your videos, it can become very boring for your audience to watch. The second way you can have motion in a video is for you to purposely move the camera, either by zooming or panning or executing some other kind of movement that has no direct relationship to what is happening within the frame. That is called unmotivated camera movement, and it's something that should be used very sparingly. You cannot add drama where it doesn't already exist or make a boring shot interesting just by zooming the lens or panning the camera around. Now the third type of motion that you can have in your videos is a hybrid of the other two, and it ought to be what you're striving to achieve. First, we want the wildlife we're filming to be active rather than just sitting there stationary. And second, we need to be able to move the camera smoothly as we track the movements of the animal as it walks, runs, swims, flies, or slithers. When you have an animal doing something interesting and you can track its movement smoothly, then you're well on your way to having excellent cinematic wildlife footage. But please don't make the mistake of thinking that your wildlife footage must always have some kind of grandiose camera movement with lots of action. That's not the case. Sometimes just subtle camera movements, such as when you change the composition a little bit when an animal turns its head, is all it takes to keep your video from looking too much like a slideshow. Footage that incorporates smooth, motivated camera movement, however slight, is always going to look better than if you had just locked the camera down on a static shot. So if we must be able to track wildlife action smoothly for video, that means we'll need to make some changes from how we're accustomed to shooting photos. First up is the use of a tripod. Now, in my opinion, the decision of whether or not to shoot from a tripod for still photography is completely optional and comes down to a matter of personal preference. Some people like tripods and some people don't. Personally, I hardly ever use a tripod when I'm shooting stills, but I use a tripod 99.9% .9 of the time when I'm shooting wildlife video. I would even go so far as to say that the use of a tripod is pretty much mandatory for filming wildlife, and I can't think of very many situations where the use of a tripod wouldn't be required. Tripods are so important to successful wildlife filming that I've devoted an entire chapter to that very topic. 
In chapter five, we'll talk about choosing an appropriate tripod system for video, how to get it set up properly, how to get it counterbalanced and calibrated for use with your camera, and then I'll show you how to execute nice, smooth movements, particularly when tracking birds in flight, probably the hardest type of wildlife to shoot. If you can master birds in flight, then you'll be ready for almost anything Mother Nature puts in front of you. Perhaps the biggest technical difference between video and stills is shutter speed. In fact, the number one problem I see with amateur wildlife footage is when novices have used the wrong shutter speed. There is a very narrow range of shutter speeds that will look normal to the average viewer. You'll never see shutter speeds on high-end wildlife productions from Nat Geo, Discovery, Nature, the BBC, etc. that don't strictly adhere to certain industry standard shutter speeds. And we'll take a detailed look at recommended shutter speeds for various shooting modes in chapters 7 and 9. But in the meantime, here is the main thing you need to know about shutter speed. In professional video and film production, the shutter speed should never be changed to adjust the exposure. Yes, the speed of the shutter does influence the exposure, but changes to the exposure should always be viewed as a side effect of changing the shutter speed, not the reason for changing the shutter speed in the first place. Another significant difference between photos and video is how many frames you must capture in order to have a usable final product. For photos, just one single frame is all you need to hang on the wall or post on social media. But for video, a single frozen moment in time won't cut it. We need to capture between 24 and 30 frames per second, all with perfect exposure, sharp focus, and pleasing composition, or we've got nothing at all. And when you consider that video clips generally need to have a running time of at least 10 to 20 seconds to be of any use, that means we need to capture anywhere from 240 to 600 perfect images in a row. And that is not always easy to do. 10 seconds of tracking a bird in flight with perfect exposure and focus can seem like an eternity when you're a beginner. As I'm sure you know, RAW is the preferred format choice for serious still photographers because it captures the maximum amount of information from the camera sensor. Personally, when I'm shooting still photographs, regardless of the camera I'm shooting with, I always record RAW files and I would never think of capturing JPEGs only. But video is different. There are very few cameras that can record raw video files internally. Yes, there are a few cameras that can output a raw video signal to a standalone external recorder, but adding that kind of hardware to your camera rig greatly increases the cost, the complexity, the weight, the bulk, the power requirements, the size of the video files, and the time it will take you to process those raw files in post. Here's something that might surprise you. Probably less than 1% of all professional video production is recorded with a raw file format. Why? Well, as I noted already, most cameras can't record RAW internally, and using an external recorder is usually undesirable, even for professionals. Now, a big reason RAW hasn't got much traction for professional film and television production is because we use a shooting mode called Log, which provides most of the benefits of RAW, but without the giant file sizes and other hassles that come with RAW. Also, RAW only provides a very small increase in image quality, and that difference often won't even be visible on screen by the time the footage is color graded, edited, and viewed on broadcast television or streamed online. We'll talk more about RAW, LOG, REC 709, compression, bit rate, color depth, and other topics related to choosing the right recording format in chapters 3 and 8. One of the biggest advantages of shooting RAW photos is that you can be a little sloppy with your exposure. As long as the exposure is in the right ballpark, and the histogram shows that you haven't clipped the highlights or crushed the shadows, there's a very good chance that you can use Lightroom to create a very nice finished image. But video isn't that easy. Simply protecting the highlights from clipping isn't good enough for video. And to make matters worse, you cannot rely on auto exposure to do the job for you. Auto exposure can be fine when you're shooting stills, but it's always going to be the wrong choice for video. Now there are basically three reasons why auto exposure should not be used for video. First, the camera usually won't choose what an experienced professional would consider the best creative exposure settings for a given situation. For example, you may want to minimize depth of field so that you can isolate an animal from the background and foreground, but on automatic, the camera might choose an f-stop that provides the totally opposite result. Second, your camera isn't smart enough to know what you're shooting or which subject in the frame should be given priority. This is a particular concern when you're filming wildlife that might only partially fill the frame. And third, 
Whenever you use auto exposure, you run the risk of the exposure fluctuating up or down unexpectedly right in the middle of your shots. And that always looks amateurish. So if you're not already comfortable shooting with full manual exposure, then you better get used to it quickly because that's the only way you're going to shoot professional caliber wildlife video. Fortunately, I can honestly say that judging the exposure and setting the exposure is pretty easy for anyone to master once they've been given a little training. Capturing sharply focused images is probably our number one priority when shooting wildlife. If your focus is off, there's not really anything you can do about it after the fact. No amount of sharpening in post is going to make an out of focus image look good. And nothing can be more frustrating than having a great opportunity ruined because the focus wasn't sharp enough. Now I think every serious wildlife photographer would agree that autofocus technology is more than good enough for taking still photos. No matter which model of camera or lenses you own, chances are they can do a better job of focusing on fast moving wildlife than you could do manually. Unfortunately, if you're under the impression that you'll be able to rely completely on autofocus when filming wildlife, you need a reality check. Most video cameras have terrible autofocus for anything that isn't a human face. And even though technology is improving all the time, you're still going to need some very good manual focusing skills. In chapter 10, I'll share my recommended settings, shooting techniques, and other tips and tricks for both autofocus and manual focus. And then you'll be fully prepared to use whatever combination works best for you, depending on the shooting situation. With photography, there's essentially no audio to worry about. But for video, capturing good sound can help bring your wildlife footage to life and adds another level of engagement for your audience. Unfortunately, recording clean sounds of nature can be very difficult, if not impossible, in some locations. Visually, you can use a telephoto lens to zoom in on the subject and eliminate man-made clutter and other visual junk that might be located just outside the edges of the frame. But you can't zoom in like that for sound. We've got to contend with traffic noise, airplanes buzzing overhead, people talking, dogs barking in the distance, car doors slamming, boat motors, and even the very annoying sound of camera shutters clicking from nearby photographers who are trying to shoot the same thing I am. Even in ideal shooting conditions, out in the middle of nowhere, the extra equipment and effort required to record audio adds another layer of complexity to the job of shooting video that photographers never have to deal with. In chapter 13, We'll talk more about how to capture clean audio and what workarounds are available when that is not possible. Another key difference between photos and video involves composition. There are almost no rules regarding aspect ratios, resolution, or print sizes for photos. For instance, you could take a huge 50 megapixel photo, crop it down in Lightroom or Photoshop, and still export a smaller version as a 4x6, 5x7, 8x10, 11x14, or any other size and or aspect ratio you want, depending on the intended use. But for video, you'll have very little leeway for cropping or reframing your footage in post. Generally, what you shoot is what you're going to be stuck with later, so it better look good before you press the record button. Not only is cropping not really a viable option for video, you'll also find that simple image editing changes that we take for granted with still photos, such as removing dust spots, cloning out unwanted clutter, and even fixing sloping horizons are generally going to be impossible to do for video if you don't have a ton of time to spend working on it, plus the high-end skills and software of a Hollywood visual effects artist. Now, that doesn't mean that no image editing will be done in post. As you'll learn in chapter 22, I believe strongly that everything needs to be processed and enhanced in post to fine tune contrast, highlights, sharpness, color, and other attributes of the image. This is especially necessary if you're shooting raw or with a log format. What I'm saying is that removing unwanted elements from the background or fixing other mistakes that were made at the time of shooting can be extremely difficult to fix for video. Therefore, extra care must be taken at the time of shooting to ensure that the image is nicely composed. We'll talk more about color grading and processing your video in post during chapters 20 through 23. Another key difference between photos and video is what we ultimately do with our images after they have been captured and processed in post. When we take a photograph, it is often intended to be used as a standalone item. Standalone images are useful for publishing in a book, printing in a monthly calendar, framing and hanging on a wall, emailing to friends and family, posting on social media, displaying in an online gallery, or using as a desktop image on your computer. 
But when we shoot a video clip, it is often intended to be just one element of a greater story, a story that will be edited together into a sequence of images during post-production to tell a greater story than is possible with a single clip alone. So what does that mean to you? Well, it means that when you go out filming wildlife, you must be prepared to capture a variety of clips rather than just hunting for that one single, really great, standalone frozen moment in time. We need to use cameras and lenses that allow us to quickly capture wide shots, medium shots, close-ups, extreme close-ups, and everything in between, so that there is enough variety in our footage that a nice finished video can be cut together. So now that you have a better understanding of the differences between shooting video and stills, we can go ahead and compare various cameras and evaluate their pros and cons. And that is the subject of chapter three.